You're now listening to the Live Different Podcast with Matt Wilson. What's up, Live Different Podcast community? It's Matt with some exciting news for you. Before we get into tonight's episode with Karen Brown, an amazing author and leadership consultant, I'm excited to share that I will be launching a second podcast, the Millennial Travel Podcast. Some of them will be published here on the Live Different podcast, but others will be exclusive interviews with travel bloggers, sustainability experts, digital nomads on how they have done it, the real micro way to get you up and traveling. I am soon to come out with the Millennial Travel Guidebook, my first book. I will be the sole author of which I'm so excited to share with the world and also motivating myself by putting this out there because I'm only about halfway done. So anyway, if there is somebody that you would like to see on an upcoming podcast, guest recommendation, suggestion, hit me up on Instagram at Matt Wilson TV. I will respond to your message. Would be thrilled to connect with you. And if you like this podcast, I would Also be thrilled if you could go to iTunes, leave me a five-star review because this will help spread the word about all the great things we're doing here in our community. So thank you guys. Get ready for an awesome show. Hello, everyone, and welcome. I'm your host, Matt Wilson, and today I'm here with Karen Brown. Karen is the CEO of Velocity Leadership Consulting, a business psychology coaching company and an Ironman world championship finisher. She is a world-class ultra-endurance athlete and the author of Unlimiting Beliefs, Seven Keys to Greater Success in Your Personal and Professional Life, told through the journey of the toughest race in the world. She is on a mission to eradicate limiting beliefs, as am I, and I am very excited to talk to her about that and pass on all of the wisdom that she has to share. So Karen, without further ado, welcome. Thank you, Matt. Thrilled to be on your show and hello, everyone in the audience. Yes, yes, yes. I uh, was saying to you uh, before we got started uh, that I've been enjoying your book and it really dives into your story of your journey to even muster up the courage to enter yourself into the toughest race in the world. So I I was hoping that you could tell a little bit of your story for people who are not familiar with it. Yeah, absolutely. Well, for a couple of decades, I was outwardly successful. I was pursuing a very fulfilling career as a professional. And yet at the same time, because I had this great life, really everything I could want. And yet at the same time, I had this nagging feeling growing inside me that I was capable of more and that there was more available and that I wasn't tapping into it. And that feeling came every time I saw the Ironman World Championships on TV, which is every November, but the race is actually every October. And What I realized after all that time is that I was holding myself back from pursuing that big, audacious, hairy, scary, ridiculous dream through something called limiting beliefs. And limiting beliefs are a scientifically proven concept that happen in our unconscious mind and they happen in a split second. And limiting beliefs go exactly like this. When we say or think, well, I don't have enough time, talent, money, support, whatever to achieve X. And X for me was the Ironman World Championships. And the thing that I found in discovering limiting beliefs and doing more research and study about them is that they're the number one scientifically proven thing that holds all of us back from pursuing and achieving our dreams. And So once I realized all of this and actually embarked on my journey to the Ironman, because at the same time I discovered them, I learned how to conquer and transform them and transform them into 
unlimiting beliefs. And that's why I wrote the book, because I wanted to make this accessible to everyone in the world. And now it's my mission to eradicate limiting beliefs and transform our world. Because when you think about when none of us suffer from limiting beliefs and we truly can pursue and achieve everything we desire, it will be a very different world. And by leaning into six other concepts that I learned, uh, which leverage the power of the unconscious mind, which no one or only people like you and, and a few other people talk about in the world, but have existed for hundreds of years, actually, when we all tap into that strength and power of our unconscious mind, literally anything is possible. And so that's why I put those in the book, because by tapping into those, after struggling to pursue this dream for a couple of decades, I then was able to jump fully into it and cross the finish line in Hawaii two short years later. Amazing. Amazing. So Karen, what made you believe in the early days that you could not do what you wanted to do in life? Mm. Well, that's interesting because I was always raised and told by my parents that I could really do anything that I wanted. Beautiful. And, and they would tell me that. Yeah, they would tell me that all the time. So I was clearly pursuing that in my professional life. But like I said, with this dream of the Ironman, I was holding myself back. And what really happened was I had this feeling deep inside, like I mentioned, that I could do it, like maybe I have what it takes to do that, but it was really scary. I mean, I, I wasn't a triathlete. I was totally recreational. I had never ridden a road bike. I had never run a marathon. And, you know, so this, this whole world was foreign to me and I didn't have the first clue basically about how to get there, the, even the first step to take. And I think that's what a lot of us run into. That doesn't mean though, and didn't mean for me that I didn't have the ability to do it. I did. And I think all of us as humans do, you know, we're wired to be able to achieve anything we can dream up. And we're also wired to have limiting beliefs come up for us first, because basically when we were cavemen, that's how our unconscious mind protected us and kept us alive. Well, you know, in modern day society, it's actually a hindrance that we sort of have to understand how our operating system works and then hack into it, you know, to shift it through something called neuroplasticity and then get it to support us in the way that we want for what we want to achieve. Beautiful. And before we really dive into the science behind this, I do want to point out to everyone how extreme these races are in case they are not aware of what you put yourself through. So can you explain the event uh, in a little bit more detail, how long each leg is and how fast that you have to finish it? I mean, there's a time limit on the thing, so it's it's quite impressive. I mean, world-class ultra-endurance athlete is no understatement. Mm. Yeah. So the Ironman World Championships is the best of the best. So there are about 50 Ironman races throughout the world that some of which are qualifiers. And basically this is a race for mostly professional athletes or the fastest athletes on the planet to qualify for and then compete in, in Kona, Hawaii. And so the race breaks down like this. It is a 2.4 mile swim in the ocean followed by a 112 mile bike ride and then finished off with a marathon. And you're right. You have 17 hours to complete it. It's completed all at once, back to back to back for all three legs. And you're competing with 2000 of your closest friends and athletic colleagues out there. And it, you know, it's on the big island of Hawaii and there's significant weather challenges there. I mean, extreme heat, extreme wind. Like I said, you're swimming in the ocean. And yeah, so it's, that's why some say it's the toughest race in the world. And I really, even though at the time I was pursuing that, it was the biggest thing I could fathom. I mean, my mind couldn't really expand past the Ironman until I actually did it. And then I realized that it was a gateway to 
a lot of other things. First of all, opening my mind and expanding myself to greater professional success, coming into touch and clarity with my purpose. And then also I use that as a gateway to get into ultra endurance uh, sports on an international level, which you know, at the time really kind of blew my mind, but it was the natural step for me. And that includes things like something called the Ultraman, which is a three-day, 320-mile triathlon where you circumnavigate the big island of Hawaii. Oh, my God. Yeah. So, you know, some people say I went, you know, completely off the rails after Iron Man and, and jumped into the ultra world. But it has been the most beautiful eight years, you know, immersing myself in that world and expanding myself on all fronts and, you know, also traveling the world like you do, getting to know other cultures, getting to know people in those cultures and just the experiences, which I know you're all about. And so are your listeners. The experiences have been staggering, absolutely staggering. That's amazing. And Karen, as an athlete, and of course, I'm a little timid to ask, but it wasn't like you started racing these things when you were 19 years old. You were a little bit of an older athlete, if you don't mind me saying, if if you'd like to say how old you were, I'm sure people will look it up on the race website. But I mean, this is masochistic to your body. <laughs> so this is not easy to recover from after probably you're the after age 25, you know, your your recovery is going to start to go down. Would you agree with that? Agree. <laughs> okay. Yes, you, you can I just agree. You picking that up. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Hey, I'll, I'll be completely open book with everybody. Yeah. I finally realized that limiting beliefs were holding me back at age 44. And up to that point, I had always been athletic and, you know, fairly fit. You know, I would go to the gym five days a week, you know, do an hour worth of workout, either cardio or weights. And then I would mountain bike or run uh, on the weekend. And I would I would sign up and complete races like 10K and maybe a half marathon. But the things I would sign up for never, you know, they were all things I knew that I could complete. You know, I knew without a doubt that I could, that none of them were stretching me beyond what I thought my comfort zone or my perceived limits were until I thought about the Ironman. And so at age 44, yeah, without being a talented athlete, I mean, totally real with everybody, I have no natural talent in that area. I mean, I am like every listener on your podcast right now. I'm not naturally fast and I have to work my tail off to do these kinds of things. And I'm just driven by a spirit and an, a deep emotion to do these and, and realize everything that I can be through them because it, it also permeates the rest of my life. And yeah, it was a shock to the system for sure. I mean, I went from, you know, the recreational level that I just talked about to doing two to three workouts a day, six days a week. You know, at the pinnacle, Ironman training is 22 to 24 hours a week. And that's not including all of the other things that you have to do, like physical therapy and chiropractic and massage and nutrition and sure. getting more sleep, you know, to support your body in performing at this ultra high level. My God. Well, very, very impressive feat. Uh, so, so thank you for sharing that with us, Karen. And of course, I want to get into now these beliefs that you hold and that you didn't always have. One quick question so we can point out to readers also that you were successful in business before you started racing. And that's important to note because you, you said something interesting. You said that your parents always told you you could do anything you wanted to do in the world. And in the business world, you you went ahead and did that. So could you talk a little bit about your career and then we can contrast it to these crazy physical feats that you had to overcome? Yes. So I began in commercial real estate about 23 years old. And honestly, I had no earthly idea what I was doing there. I sort of backed into this wonderful job with two incredible people that I worked for that showed me everything. I mean, they really shepherded me and showed me everything and fostered that learning and my development. And I basically started 
by, you know, the interview process. And they said, well, what's your ultimate goal? I said, to have your job. And they said, all right, well, we'll help you achieve that. And they did. So I sort of naturally took to leadership and I've always been fascinated with human behavior. And so I was able to be an effective coach to my team members within each organization where I worked. And and this was before coaching was kind of a formal thing, right? I mean, this was just called team building back then, but I was good at it and I naturally gravitated toward it. So I did that for the better part of 25 years through different companies of all sizes, privately held, publicly held, you know, small, regional, behemoth, you know, everybody, and really had a ball doing it. And, you know, my greatest fulfillment was developing team members and seeing them step into and realize their full potential. I mean, that's just where it's at, I think, as far as I'm concerned as a leader, and learned a lot about leadership along the way. And I'm usually the person that is kind of like Thomas Edison. Like I discover all the ways not to do it or that it's not going to work before I stagger (laughs) onto the way that it does. And I think that's really important, you know, for a lot of us. It certainly was for me because you learn the most through the situations where you fail forward, right? I mean, it's easier when you're successful, but you don't learn as much. So I did that for 25 years and then also realized that there was this place that we couldn't really get to when we were coaching, which through the Ironman journey, I came to understand was getting into the unconscious mind and how that really drives all learning, change, and behavior. I mean, here's a crazy statistic that I learned along the way that our conscious mind is only responsible for 0.008% of all of our thoughts and actions in a day. Wow. The balance, yeah, is all unconscious. So we're not very aware. I mean, I've met folks like you that, you know, over time you become more aware and you grow and develop your awareness of yourself and your body and your thoughts and your actions. And you can call it emotional awareness because that, that is part of it, but it's even deeper than that. And so that's what I really became fascinated with and realized that that was the missing link. And so that's when I founded Velocity and, you know, really stepped into my purpose, which I believe is to, again, eradicate limiting beliefs and transform the world and also help leaders elevate and improve their leadership and professional performance. Because I think that has an enormous impact on everyone that that leader comes into contact with. Okay. So Karen, when you first started recognizing that there were things below the surface, unconscious beliefs that were holding you back personally, what did you learn about yourself? Oh, goodness, Matt, that's a whole nother show. (laughs) (laughs) Let's do it. (laughs) Oh, gosh. So I learned my behavioral patterns which is what we work on at Velocity with our clients. And what I'm always interested in, in every conversation I'm having with human beings, just, you know, what's the behavioral pattern here and where did it come from? I learned that my primary behavioral pattern was that if it was something in my personal life, then I would have limiting beliefs most readily about it first Whereas in my professional life, I had the opposite. I was able to sort of suspend or have unlimiting beliefs about abilities in my professional life. And I would just immediately spring into action with them. I mean, it it was like a split second decision. Okay, I want to do that. And then I would just jump in with both feet and knew I was going to be able to do it. But completely the opposite in my personal life. So uncovering that behavioral pattern was a big key. And then learning where that came from. You know, I, I happen to believe, and I've, I've seen this anecdotally in working with a lot of people over time, also in studying the neurosciences, I believe that a lot of behavioral patterns come from early in life. And some of the ones that hold us back the most are from unresolved trauma. Mm-hmm. 
Yeah. And I don't want anyone to, to get the wrong impression when I say trauma, because usually when I throw that word out, people have a reaction to it like, well, I don't have any trauma in my life, you know, thinking that, you know, that means they were abused or, you know, something major like that. Sure. And that's not what, that's not what trauma is. It really just amounts to something that was difficult emotionally for you and that your unconscious mind had a tough time wrapping itself around. It really couldn't process it. And so all that happens is it encapsulates that trauma and it forms a piece of baggage, which means that every time you go to do something similar or you have a similar thought or experience, it's a very simplistic machine. And so it will think, oh, well, this time is just like that time. And then it'll cause you to pull back from doing whatever it is you're thinking about doing. So it's really as simple as, you know, habitual behavioral patterns that start with some root cause, you know, that happened. Okay, so I'll give you a very basic example of one that I can think of in my own life. And you can tell me if this is the type of pattern that you're trying to identify. I might have spoken about this on a previous podcast. I don't know. But so I changed schools in third grade. Uh, my family moved from New England to New York. And when I was going to school in the beginning of the year, we were doing multiplication. And when I got to the new school, they were doing division. And I was lost because I didn't know my multiplication tables yet. And they were memorizing the division ones. And from that day on, I suddenly seemed to have this behavioral pattern, this thought pattern, this limiting belief that said I was not good at math and it did not change. I So I've always said, I'm, I'm still not going to say I'm a natural at it, but I did not overcome that until I worked so hard in college on my, you know, whatever calculus classes that I was taking and statistics and, and that type of stuff where the math lab where I would hang out constantly actually offered me a job in the math lab. And it's actually, it's one of my dad's favorite stories ever because he always, everybody told me I just wasn't good at math. There wasn't nothing, there wasn't anything that I could do. And that was my limiting belief for the next you know, whatever, 15 years of my academic career until I realized, wait a second, I can actually, I can actually do this. This is not that hard. Is this an example of one of those behavioral traumas? Yes. Okay. Yes. It's a great example. Yeah. And let me, let me jump fully into that. Please. Oh, cause this, this is good stuff, Matt. Thank you for sharing this with me. No, you're welcome. Yeah. So limiting beliefs come from a limiting decision. And so your limiting decision and, and limiting decisions often are formed in our unconscious mind through comparison, or they can certainly happen from someone telling us we'll never be able to do something. Oh, you know, you're incapable of doing that. You'll never be able to do that. You won't ever be able to do that. That's certainly how a limiting decision is formed. But most often it's formed from comparison. And you, when you're in third grade and went to the new school, you were comparing yourself and your abilities to those of your fellow students. They were already in division. You hadn't, you know, memorized your multiplication. So that gap, between the two is where the limiting decision was made. Literally, like they're up here, I'm down here, and I can't perform. I can't bridge that gap. That's a limiting decision. And that's the root cause then of the limiting belief, that pattern that then just keeps getting repeated until college, you know, when you were in the math lab and they offered you a job. And, and then you actually systematically you know, put yourself in that position to have to do math and you took one step at a time to actually transform that limiting belief with action. That's exactly how a limiting belief is transformed and turned into an unlimiting belief, which serves you in doing something that you would like to do. Okay. Okay. Excellent. And do you find that these are more common in people's personal lives where maybe there's just unresolved stuff 
going on there that they don't necessarily have time, not have time to look at, but they just don't resolve it, don't really look in there at what their psychological patterns are, whether if it's their, a big one I know is relationship to money that I had to work on or, you know, in interpersonal relationships as well. And that that stuff gets very complicated where as I would just guess, I haven't put too much thought into it, but if it's career-wise, you're usually just adverse to the stuff that you don't like. Like if somebody told you you weren't good at math, well, I'm certainly not going to be an accountant. And in fact, my business partner takes care of our accounting in our current business. And I don't have to war- deal with that too much other than the the uh, you know monthly budgets and stuff like that. But do you see it more in people's personal life? Oh, that's a great question. Actually, it's pervasive in both. Okay. You know, when I'm working with leaders... I see that it typically shows up more in their professional world, in the business setting Mm. uh, when they go to work. So that seems to be the, you know, the point of entry, if you will. But the same pattern is being repeated in their personal life as well. They just don't see it because think about it this way. You know, when it is this piece of baggage or something that goes unresolved, then It's hanging out in our unconscious mind and that causes us to avoid it, right? Because for years you said, you know, you just lived with this limiting belief of I'm not good at math. And quite frankly, between you and me, I suffered from the same thing. Mm. (laughs) I always said I didn't have the math gene because that's what I thought it took to do math. Yeah, but my point is that then you just naturally behaviorally start avoiding that thing, whatever it is, because that proliferates the pattern. And so it happens in your personal and your professional life, but you don't tend to see it in both and you're not connecting the dots that it's the same pattern. So, and I can even say for myself, although I didn't see it at the time, again, because I was avoiding it, it was present in my professional life because even though I would identify something that I wanted to do, and then a split second decision and jump in and go for it. But I could have gone so much bigger in my professional life and I wasn't. So that was the pattern. That's the way it showed up in my professional life. I wasn't putting the two together. And and let me go one step further with this. I also thought that my personal dream had no implications on my professional performance. Like I thought they were two separate things. I see. And what I came to find out was really powerful because in stepping into and pursuing and achieving that big personal dream, it actually opened everything up much further, much bigger than anything I'd ever done previously professionally. Okay. Yeah. You hear that a lot. A lot of different examples of friends and colleagues start to come into mind. In fact, people who go and travel and realize, oh my God, what am I doing with my life? It affects, it's both personal and professionally. People that come on our trips uh, with under 30 experiences and they realize, wait a second, I'm not only in the wrong career or I'm not only going down the wrong path right now, but I'm also in a toxic relationship. And those two things probably have very similar underlying patterns and underlying belief systems. Is that fair to say? Yes. I love that you made that point. Yeah. So what you just described is what I call an opener. And so, you know, for this change to take place, there's got to be some some mechanism, some opener, something that opens you up, like uh, literally opens your eyes, like you just said, uh, that folks that come on your experiences and travel, that you finally see your behavioral patterns and what they've led you to, and that that's not what you want. So that true reflection is the opener to then being aware that you want a different path. You want something different than you're actually getting. And that is actually the first step to being able to change it. You know, limiting beliefs, 
a habitual thought pattern. Yeah, that's the first step in being able to change it. Okay, beautiful. And Karen, are there specific openers that you recommend for people or situations or circumstances in which people can discover what's going on inside and bring those to their attention so that they can change? Yes, yes. First of all, I think an easy one for every human being is a physical opener. So, and I think this is why, you know, what you said just now was, is so right on target because if you are traveling physically, you're doing yoga, you know, for me, it was the Ironman, you know, it was a significant athletic challenge, right? And you, you see this all over the place. So, you know, we're, you know, spiritual beings having a human experience, right? And so when we fully step into that human experience, that's a physical one. And so that's an easy opener, I would say for most people, you know, if they sign up for a 10 K or they want to do something physically that they've never done, that is something that usually provides that catalytic opening. Also, one of the tools that I am providing to your listeners today is a tool to use for the technique of conquering and transforming your limiting beliefs and unlimiting them. And the way that we start off with that, which is another great way to facilitate an opening, is to ask a key question. And that key question is, what is stopping me from achieving X? Because that actually, by asking that kind of question, it actually gets into and opens up your unconscious mind. And that's where all this stuff is hanging out. So you can access it uh, quite easily. Yeah. And for, you know, folks that don't really uh, relish the thought of doing something physical or climbing a mountain or doing an Ironman or, you know, whatever, because I, you know, I, I see that sometimes, well, I don't have any inkling to do an Ironman. I say, great, cool. So tell me this, what's stopping you from achieving what you desire right now? Excellent. And it works every time. Excellent. And do you recommend meditating on this, journaling about it, just pondering it for a couple days? How do you walk people through some type of process at arriving at an answer that they may or may not be happy with? (laughs) I'm glad you pointed that out. You're right, because you can't judge whatever comes out. It just is. Yeah. So actually, because the processing speed of your unconscious mind is so much faster, I mean, a million times faster than your conscious mind, really all that's required is is not a length of time to figure out or come up with the answer. That's more how your conscious mind works. When you tap into your unconscious mind, it works so much faster. All that's really required is that you are in a distraction-free environment that you literally are just in a quiet space where you can just ruminate on that question and then be present to what comes up. Because immediately, once you get past that initial reaction of, well, I don't know, because a lot of times is the initial reaction of the mind. But when you just stay with it and keep asking yourself and ruminating on that question, an answer or two or three or four are going to bubble up really fast. I mean, this doesn't take any more than five minutes as long as you're in a distraction-free environment. So yes, that does mean maybe turn your phone off and shut down the computer. And then the next step is writing those things down. So it is journaling in a sense, but you know, it doesn't need to be you know a, a 10-page dissertation. It just needs to be capturing what bubbled up for you, you know, those limiting beliefs, because they're right on the surface of your unconscious mind. And they come just pouring out as soon as you ask that question in a contemplative state. Beautiful. Well, I'm glad that this has so much relevance for me right now. I'm in the process of writing my first book called The Millennial Travel Guidebook. And the first three or four chapters are actually on limiting beliefs and how people can let them go. So people always say, oh, I don't have the X to travel, right? It's Mm -hmm. usually the time or it's 
the money or it's the support of their family. <laughs> they say, oh, my mm-hmm. God, you're going to go to, you know, Southeast Asia, you're going to end up in a body bag, right? Uh, we mm-hmm. all have those relatives who are genuinely concerned about them. But in each chapter, I have actually... The cornerstone of each chapter is an action item where you sit quietly and you write down, okay, what are my beliefs right now about money and how can I make this in an, into an investment rather than just a, a frivolous spend and how this can actually benefit people. So thank you for this. I, I might have to uh, put some of your information and some of your exercises in the book. Yes. Oh, I'm so glad to hear you're writing that book. Oh my goodness. Yeah. The world is going to benefit greatly from your knowledge and your help and your expertise. And yes, share, share, share. I mean, this is honestly how, you know, we change the world, you know, how something becomes a movement and really makes a difference in the world. And uh, I think that's what we're both looking to do. So I'm stoked about it. Well, thank you, Karen. I have to ask if there were no more limiting beliefs in the world or forget no more because of course a lot of people would say that that is physically impossible okay my limiting beliefs are saying that that's impossible right now but say we changed just one percent of the human population's mind and got rid of their limiting beliefs and they could go and personally affect 90 you know the 99 other people around them what would that world look like oh my gosh that's what i love stepping into because you know that world would be one where we fully support one another by lifting each other up and saying yeah you can do that and what can i do to support you to do that you know here's a good example when i decided to pursue the Iron Man. And I started sharing that with people. With everyone I shared it, including family, there were literally three, count them three, people who were in my corner. They never batted an eye and said, yes, I know you'll be able to do that. What can I do to support you? Mm -hmm. Everybody else was, you know, a negative Nancy, a doubting Thomas was like, oh my gosh, I don't even know how you would do that. Or worse, even my own husband at the time said, you don't have what it takes to do that. And you know what? You don't deserve to be there. Mm. And so that was what would change in our world, that we would all come to the table with this deep understanding of, you know, our truth, which is, We can do anything. Literally, we are wired up to do anything that we can dream up. And so I think it's the biggest gift that we can give each other when we actually realize that and we see it in each other and we bring it out and we support it. Well, that sounds like a world that I would like to be a part of. And I'm glad that we're working together to see that change in the world uh, come into fruition. And if people are listening out there, please, you can, uh, at the end of the show, uh, you can reach out to Karen. I'm always available for listeners to be able to interact with. And this is why we put this type of content out, because we want to build that community of people who, who believe those type of things. And Karen, I wanted to take this to the next level because we've talked about success in your professional life. We've talked about success in your personal life with through athletics. And I'm picking up that all of this, this entire transformation that you had to go through surrounding yourself by the right people and what that did for your psyche it seems like there were some spiritual outcomes that came through that as well. So I was was wondering if that was the case and if you could tell us a little bit more about that. Oh, yes, yes. Lots of spiritual growth and outcomes for sure. Remember I said, you know, when I started pursuing this, I had no earthly idea what to do. 
so the first thing I did was hire a coach, you know, to have someone to show me what to do. Cause I didn't even know what I didn't know. Again, I was never part of this world called triathlon. And the other thing that I did right out of the gate was uh, this was just true for me, you know, however this works for everybody listening, Hey, that's up to you. Interpret it how you will. But I started praying twice a day and it was a very simple prayer. Just, you know, God grant me the strength and the wisdom to see this through, to do what I need to do today, you know, to achieve this. And uh, I tell you what, Matt, it, it was amazing to open myself up like that because I'm by nature a very achievement oriented person. A long time ago, old school, we used to say type A personality, right? Yeah. I'm a doer. I'm an achiever. I tend to rely on myself and my own abilities. So, you know, for me to, to kind of surrender and open this up to a greater power than myself and ask for help was a big deal. And I, I just leaned into it fully. And I tell you what, every day, people and conversations and information would just show up that was the next thing that I needed. I mean, there, there are many examples of this in my book. And there are a lot more that I, you know, it, the book would have been 500 pages if I would have included all of them. <laughs> but, you know, I think that is a piece, you know, that goes along with unlimiting your beliefs. I mean, like I said before, we as human beings, you know, we're spiritual beings having a human experience and we are wired up to be spiritual. And, you know, so that's a part of it that goes hand in hand with this. And I think when we can bring that into the fold, step into that, it makes it honestly easier and faster. And I think in that way, we're also able to bring other people along because the other thing that that revealed to me is that we really are all connected, that there's none of this separateness or isolation that we sometimes feel as humans, that we really are all connected. And when we do show up for each other and, you know, are open to each other, that connection, that flow just happens between us. And I mean, that's the great stuff of this life, you know, and being on the planet with each other. I mean, you know, just very simplistically, what I've learned from other people over time from all over the world is actually mind blowing when I think about it. But from a spiritual perspective, it makes all the sense in the world. Like, yeah, this is why we're here. You know, we're supposed to help each other through this stuff, not grit our teeth and white knuckle it, you know, individually trying to make our way. Right, right. Yeah, thank you for sharing that, Karen. And for people out there who are listening to this and are that type A personality, achievement oriented, believe that they are completely responsible for their own destiny, which may be the case. Uh, but I mean, you started this off by saying that the first thing you did, or one of the first things that you did was start to pray. So I'm curious if you've looked into any of the science behind what that actually does ingraining positive things into your subconscious, because that seems to be a big part of, uh, of what you teach. Oh, absolutely. Yes. And here's how that works. You know, the act of praying or opening yourself up, asking for help actually tells and communicates what you want to your unconscious mind. So literally you're saying to your unconscious mind, okay, this is what I want. And then your unconscious mind literally hears it and says, oh, okay, that's what we want. And it goes about helping you get it. And that actually activates something called your reticular activation system, which there's a lot more heady science behind it than that, but it, it's a simplistic way to describe it. And here's a really good analogy for it. So everybody understands. Have you ever noticed that, let's say you're going to buy a car and you decide on what kind of car it is, say it's a Prius or something. And then all of a sudden you start noticing Priuses everywhere. Sure. Everywhere. Like everywhere you turn, there's a Prius. And you're like, wow, there's another Prius. I never noticed all of these before. That is your reticular activation system at work. 
So you've decided, hey, I'm going to get a Prius. And then that's your reticular activation system kicking into gear going, oh, okay, she wants a Prius. All right, we're going to get that. And so it starts to see all of those out there. Well, it's the same thing. And I described this in the book a little bit that, you know, as I kept praying and, you know, stating my intentions and, and reaffirming them, my unconscious mind went into immediate action to bring forward, you know, and I, it goes like this, where I would just notice more readily conversations that held content that were valuable to me that I needed to get to the next step, you know, coming into contact with the right people that had the next piece of information or learning that I needed. And also the other thing that happened scientifically in this process is you start becoming that person that you're seeing, you know, on your way to achieving this goal or dream. So it literally becomes your identity, you know, the act of praying, the transformation that's happening, your unconscious mind listening to what you're saying. It also, it's creating imagery of what it's going to look, feel, and sound like to achieve it. And within that, it starts becoming your identity. So, you know, I started becoming an Ironman long before I actually crossed the physical finish line. Aha. Uh -huh. That makes a lot of sense. Yeah. That seems like a really good thing to do if you were going to run one of those races. And Karen, while you were running or maybe while you were training, there must have been some excruciatingly painful, really, uh, if you will, dark times on the race where you wanted to give up or you didn't think you could push yourself anymore. And I believe there must be a lot of value of putting yourself through that type of hardship. And did you find that as a spiritual experience? And were there things that you said to yourself, mantras that you would repeat? How did you get yourself through the, the toughest of physical challenge? Mm, Matt, you asked the best questions. Thank you. <laughs> I, I appreciate this. that. Yeah. So I would say that the toughest challenges where I was very tempted to give up were not in the race day itself. They were in the journey to the race. Uh -huh. Yeah, the race day itself was a magnificent day and one filled with joy and love and expansion. And, oh, it was the best day ever. But getting there was filled with physical and emotional pain, for sure. Examples of which are, I went through a contentious divorce because my husband, you know, first of all said, you're not capable of doing that and you don't deserve to be in that race. And so he was unsupportive. And I, again, going back to the identity thing, I felt like this is who I am. This is, you know, where I want to go. And, you know, it was many times it was just a, a very pervasive feeling deep inside of me. I don't know that I can describe it better than that. But I knew like there was a, a certainty about that feeling that this is who I am meant to be. And, you know, I, I didn't want to be divorced, but, you know, that's what had to happen, you know, for me to be that person. And I think a lot of us are going to run into that kind of thing. So I went through that. I also had a high level swim instructor. And, and let me just put this into context. I was a horrible swimmer. I was such a horrible swimmer that I had two coaches. I had a triathlon coach that was helping me with swimming. And then I had a individual swim coach and that was his full-time job to help me be a better swimmer. And he was a jerk. I'm hmm. just going to put it out there. I mean, I could use a much stronger word that's two syllables and starts with A and ends with E because uh -huh. that's exactly what he was. And, and I explain this in the book, but he actually reduced me to tears several times and just said horrible, damaging things like, you know what? You are a terrible swimmer. You have a horrible feel for the water. I don't know what you're thinking. I mean, just like really nasty stuff. And you know what? It was in those moments that I really had to dig deep and look at what was happening and compare it to who I am. 
And it was tough, but I always emerged through faith and that feeling that I was destined for this and I was on my path, you know, and that would give me the strength to deal with it and to to move forward, you know, to the next step. That's the advice I would give everyone is, you know, just stick with that feeling that is deep in your gut, you know, that's in your core that you know is true, that is saying to you, you can do this. You are this person. And this is what you were meant to do. This is who you're meant to be. Stick with it because, you know, oftentimes it's those other people's limiting beliefs that they're throwing on to you. It has nothing to do. It's not the truth. It's not, you know, they're not right about your ability. We're worried that they're right, but they're not. Did you have any particular tools to get you through those times and help you stay focused on that belief because it's very easy to get sidetracked and say, you know what, you're right. This swim instructor is right. I'm a terrible swimmer. What am I doing here? Or I mean, even worse, if it's someone you're married to. So were there, you mentioned prayer. Was there anything else in particular that you did to be able to keep that belief front and center? Yes, several things. First of all, and this is another key from the book, to center myself, I would go back to what I call tapping into the dream, which is what it looked, felt, and sounded like to cross the finish line in Hawaii. Mm -hmm. And, you know, to fully step into that, you know, to feel the air on my skin, to, you know, smell what it would smell like to hear the roar of the crowd at the finish line and to feel all of the emotions that would well up like an exquisite wave inside of me crossing the finish line, feeling what it would feel like on every level, physical, emotional, mental, spiritual, you know, to be that person that I saw myself becoming in the culmination at the finish line of that race. So tapping into the dream and specifically the emotions of it, right? That's what always brought me back to center. And then I always had one or two go-to like mantra songs that I would play over and over. And I would write some of the words on my water bottles that I would put in the water in the cages on my bike. So I had a vision board, one at work and one at home. And I would put you know, visual reminders of what this dream meant for me. And so that I would see those things every day. And I mean, there were reminders of my dream everywhere. I mean, there were stickers on my window of my car so that every time I got in and out of my car, I saw it. Uh, I had a training folder that, you know, I kept all of my Ironman information and races and training schedule and everything in, and it was covered with this kind of stuff. I had socks and hats and t-shirts and, you know, everything that I could get my hands on that were just so that literally everywhere I turned and also on my phone, everywhere I turned, everywhere I looked, my dream was right there. Amazing. Amazing. Yeah. Well, yeah. geez, Karen, you, you have provided so many actionable tools, things people can take the headphones out and go do right now, including going to pick up your book, Unlimiting Your Beliefs, Seven Keys to Greater Success in Your Personal and Professional Life, told through my journey to the toughest race in the world. But if you wanted to leave everyone with one last nugget, if they're looking to eradicate the limiting beliefs in their life, what would you tell them? You've already told them a lot, but uh, would you leave them with anything extra? Yes. The last nugget I would leave them with is another scientifically proven thing that I learned on the way, which is when you think you're at your limit, you're really only at 60%, six zero of your capacity. Wow. You have 40% more within you. And I got to tell you, I tapped into that a lot, both in the Ironman journey and also a lot in my professional life. It's so helpful 
to realize that and go, no, I've got more than this. I've still got 40% in the tank. I just need to tap into it. And then it's amazing when I realize that and then I say it, sometimes I even say it out loud to myself. It's like a whole new feeling comes over me and I am re-energized and invigorated. And then I move forward again. Excellent. Excellent, Karen. Well, if people want to reach out to you, become part of your community, interact with you in some way, shape, or form in addition to your book, where can they find you online? They can find me at, uh, and I'm going to give a URL here, which is the name of my company followed by the name of your show. So the name of my company is Velocity Leadership Consulting. Dot com, and then just put a forward slash and live different behind it. And you will land on a landing page that has access to my book, uh, videos about how to use these techniques and tap into the power of your unconscious mind, the form on how to unlimit your beliefs that I talked about earlier, and a whole bunch of other stuff that I'm glad that I put into place for all of your great tribe. And if you could share this information readily, I mean, that's what I said. I'm really on a mission. So share this, you know, bring other people along with you in your transformation. It helps all of us. And then also, if you read the book and there's some significant ahas for you, if you would help me, you know, get out of the dark halls of Amazon, show me some love in a five-star review. That also really helps others. That brings others along because whatever you're sharing was your aha, it resonates with somebody else because they're struggling with the same thing. And then they go, oh, look, that person struggled with the same thing I do. Oh, maybe that would help me. And that's how we really change the world and make a difference. Excellent, Karen. Well, I certainly want to live in that world and it's already beginning. So thank you for that. And uh, anybody who's looking for that link again, we will link that in our show notes, of course, on iTunes, Under 30 Experiences, blog, et cetera, all the places that this podcast gets syndicated to. So we're looking forward to getting those tools from you, Karen. And thanks again. Really appreciate it. Such a pleasure being on your show. Thanks for having me, Matt. You're welcome.